Hey guys, welcome to your enzyme activity lab. Yet another wonderful kitchen lab in the comfort of your own home. Well, today we're looking at the effects of concentration and pH on enzyme activity. Now, what's an enzyme? An enzyme, as you might recall from lecture, is a type of protein. Kind of looks something like this baby toy right here. These might be little cell receptors on the cell itself. Anyway, I like to borrow baby toys for demos. But the point is, enzymes are a type of proteins, and proteins are one of those four compounds of life we talked about. And they're the most diverse molecules in the human body or any organism's body. They come in all sorts of shapes and sizes, do all sorts of different things. Specifically, proteins can serve structural roles like making hair and nails or parts of muscle. Um, they can serve roles as transport molecules like taking your oxygen to your cells via the protein hemoglobin or serving as enzymes. And enzymes themselves are very diverse and have all sorts of roles. They regulate things, they're part of the immune system, and they can digest things. So they break stuff down. Think of like the enzymatic cleaner on your contact lenses. And they also are catalysts. That means they speed up reactions. Now the, cat, the enzyme we're looking at today is a catalyst, and it's a catalyst called catalase. So imagine this is catalase. And catalase is a very important enzyme in our bodies because it takes this compound, hydrogen peroxide, H2O2, and breaks it into water and oxygen gas, H2O and O2. Now, why is that important? Well, that's important because H2O2, hydrogen peroxide, is a toxin to our cells, very bad, kills cells. And as you age, you have less and less catalase to break down the hydrogen peroxide and that can lead to all sorts of bad problems. So every time our body does a chemical reaction, which it does all the time with all sorts of reactions, hydrogen peroxide often forms as a waste product and it's toxic to cells and it builds up. So we need catalase to take care of that, neutralize it into water and oxygen gas. So like all proteins, enzymes are affected by environmental conditions. First of all, enzymes and all proteins don't like hot temperatures. When they get in the presence of heat, they denature. That means they fall apart. Their bonds between their amino acids get broken. They fall apart. They're no good. They won't work. Could be very, very bad for the body. Cold temperatures um, tend to slow proteins down or even kind of pause them all together until they warm back up to a more body temperature kind of temperature. Um, but, but hot temperature does more than that. It actually denatures it, makes it fall apart, and bleh, no more, no more working enzyme or protein. Well, um, so temperature is important. Now, we're not testing temperature today, but we are testing another environmental condition that's very important to the body, and that is pH. So you might recall pH scale is on from 0 to 14. It's a measurement of how much hydrogen ions are in a solution. But what's important is that right in the middle of that scale, is a pH of seven, that's neutral. So anything less than seven is acidic, anything greater than seven is basic. And most of the reactions in our body, where proteins are concerned, work best at a pH that's near neutral, near seven. So for most enzymes, with the exception of the ones in our stomach, in the presence of a strong acid, they'll denature like we talked about. They just fall apart, don't work. Um, in bases, they usually just, the reactivity is diminished, although if it's a very, very severe base, it'll denature as well. So um, they don't like acids, they don't really like high bases, they hate heat, and it turns out their activity is affected by concentration. So the more of the enzyme you have, the more of the substance can be broken down. So if I have a lot of catalase, I'll break down a lot of hydrogen peroxide. If I don't have much catalase, very little will be reacted. So we're going to look at two things in this lab. One is the effect of concentration of catalase on its activity, how well it breaks hydrogen peroxide down into water and oxygen. And the second part of the lab is we're going to look at the effect of pH on catalase. And for that, you're going to be taking a mild acid that you'll find around your kitchen, vinegar. And it doesn't really matter if you use apple cider vinegar, this is distilled vinegar, whatever. Vinegar is acidic. It has a pH of maybe about three or two, depending on the, the vinegar you're using. Um, again, we're going to be looking at how um, hydrogen peroxide is broken down in the presence of acids and bases. Now, for our base, we're going to use something that contains the chemical ammonia. Now, this is Lysol. 
And Lysol, um, if you look on the ingredients, it'll say that it contains um, ammonium chloride. So we know because of the ammonium in it, this is a base. So we're gonna use this. Now, you need to be very, very careful. Um, never, ever, ever have anything with bleach near anything with ammonium in it because they combine in the air to produce chlorine gas, highly poisonous, you'll be in the ER or worse. So don't do that, make sure there's no bleach around. The other thing is because we're working with chemicals, we need to make sure we are in our PPE, our protective, personal protective equipment. So you'll need your lab coat, your hair needs to be up if it's long, gloves, lab gloves, and approved lab goggles. And again, these goggles should cover the side so nothing can splash in there. So I'm gonna put this aside for now because we'll be doing that the second part of the lab. Uh, you will be needing the hydrogen peroxide for this part of the lab and I'll go over the other things you need. Um, you're gonna need something like a food processor. Um, blenders don't work quite as well as food processors, although they do work. I prefer a food processor. You could also use um, a mortar and pestle. This is a pestle, that's a mortar, but this is really heavy and I don't like, like it. I use it to grind up spices, but you could use it for this lab. All right, so we're gonna look at the effect of concentration of catalase in certain foods. So all organisms, whether they're a plant or an animal, have catalase because all organisms build up hydrogen peroxide as a waste product. Now, you might expect that your liver has a whole lot of catalase in it because that, the liver is the organ that detoxifies things. It gets rid of all the poisons that are, are in our body. Now, I just realized that my lab coat is not buttoned correctly, so there, much more professional. Okay, and if you notice that your lab goggles fog up as you're going through this, feel free to you know stop and go outside get some air on it and uh, just kind of clear them out. All right, so you're gonna need just a small piece of each of these foods. Um, so we're gonna look at the effect of catalase activity in three foods. We're gonna look at potato. Okay, so here's potato and I've just cut a piece. You don't need to worry about taking the skin off or anything. And each food is gonna need its own whey boat. So you remember these whey boats from your lab kit. So just go ahead and set that piece in there for now. Um, one of the things that's going to be really important is that you avoid cross-contamination among the foods. Otherwise, your results won't be believable because you don't know if the enzyme was affecting the amount of hydrogen peroxide broken down because of the catalase in that food or whether it was catalase from one of the other foods you were testing. So you need to make sure everything's clean between each food that you test. Um, so kind of control, right? So the other thing you're going to need is an apple. And I've cut up just a small piece of apple. You just need something about that size. Again, it gets its own whey boat that's clean that you haven't used for any of the other foods. So set that aside. And the other really lovely, nasty thing you're going to need is some liver. Because liver contains lots of catalase. So I just went to the grocery store, got some beef liver here. The guy charged me 96 cents for it. I bet they might even give it to you if you want because that's liver. And you're just going to need a small piece. So I have this piece right here. Um, if you use the blue forceps in your kit, these actually are good for handling the liver. Um, don't use them for any of the other things because you don't want to cross-contaminate. All right, so first thing we need to do, and I'm going to take these off for a sec. You keep yours on. Um, first thing we're going to do is we need to blend up these foods because that will release the catalase into solution, which will make our results better. We'll be able to see more of the effect of the catalase. So I'm going to use a food processor. Again, you could use other things like a mortar and pestle or a blender. Um, so I'm gonna take off my food processor here and I'm gonna go from least messy to most messy. So first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna work on the potato. Okay, so I'm just gonna take my little piece of potato, put it in my food processor and you wanna get it nice and pulpy if possible. So I'm just gonna pulverize this thing. I think I don't have this thing. Okay, food processing. Just gonna let that get nice and pulpy. Mm. Yummy. It's like making baby food. Okay, it doesn't have to be perfect, but um, once you get it, you should have enough there. So now you'll remember the ways you weigh things out. I'm going to put the scale down. So I got my digital scale here, and you want to turn it on, and then you'll remember proper weighing procedures. Take your empty weigh boat, put it on the scale, and hit T for tear. And wait till it gets to zero grams. So mine's on zero grams. I don't know if you guys can see that or not. And now I'll just kind of get some of your potato out there. 
and just let it go until it gets to five grams. Oops. So you want to get to five grams or as close to five grams as you can. It doesn't have to be, this is potato. And it's possible you didn't cut up enough potato. You might need to get some more. And I'm not there yet. 3.2. 3.1. Okay, I'm actually, so I'm only at 3.6. I'm going to have to do a little more, a little more potato. So I'm just going to take a clean knife and here's a, another little piece of potato. I'm going to put it in here. Processor. And I'm still not there. So, boop ba doop oh, Now I went too much, so I'm going to take a little out. Grams there. Awesome. So I don't know if you guys can see that, but I am at 5.0 grams of potato. So once you have that, go ahead and set that aside. Um, and now we need to weigh the apple. So I'm going to turn this off for a sec. But really important, before you weigh your apple, you need to thoroughly clean out your food processor and anything else that has touched that potato so that we don't do cross-contamination. So I'm going to pause this. I'm going to go over to the sink, use some mild dish soap, and some water, clean this baby out. I'll be right back. Okay, I'm back from dishwashing duty, and now it's time to blend up and pulverize our apples. So here's the piece of apple that I, I sliced off, adding it to the food processor, which is now clean, and away we go, pulverize. So we're gonna try to get five grams of apple, and if that's not enough, I can just add some more. In fact, I might even go ahead and add some more right now. Don't forget to clean your knives between foods. So I'm just going to add some there. Okay, nice. And sometimes it's actually easier if you use a lot of food. It blends up better than if you just use a tiny piece. All right, and then we're going to go ahead, adding the clean way boat that just our apples touched. Turn on the, turn on the scale. Don't forget to zero it. Make sure it says zero grams. Okay. And now we're going to add our apple to it. Yay. Okay, so make sure you get some of that juice in there. That's all good stuff for this lab. Okay, and I'm at 2.7. Okay, so now I'm at 5.0 grams of apple. Yay. All right, so I got my apple here. I'm going to put that aside. Make sure everything's clean. I'm going to go wash out my food processor a third time and my knife, and I will be right back. Okay. okay, I'm back with my clean food processor, ready for the final blending, and that is my liver. So I'm going to go ahead and put this into the thing, and I'm going to pause this. I'm going to blend it and come right back. Okay, so now I have done the same procedures with my liver. I weighed it. I have exactly 5.0 grams of liver. We are ready to go. So now what we're gonna need to do is label our test tube. So you wanna find the package in your box that says Enzyme Lab, and there are six plastic test tubes in here. You wanna get three of them for this first part of the first lab. You'll need the other three for the second part of the first part of the lab. Then you gotta wash them for the second part of the lab on pH. But you're gonna to want to take a permanent marker so I have just uh, this kind of permanent marker here. You could use a wax pencil, whatever. And you're gonna label one L. I'm sorry, everything's backwards in the camera. Okay, so you wanna label it L for liver. You're gonna label one A for apple. And finally, P for potato. So I got L, P, and A. Um, and then you're gonna to wanna to take your transfer pipette. So find these in your kit. Um, these are for the second part of the lab. You get this part of the lab. You want to label one H2O2. Let's see if I can turn that around for you. H2O2. Okay, that's hydrogen peroxide. You want to label one, um, actually that's all you need for this part of the lab. Just label one H2O2 and this should only touch H2O2, hydrogen peroxide. Okay, so what we're going to do is add our food that we pulverized into our test tubes. Okay, there's exactly five grams of each. So the first test tube I pulled out is apple. And by the way, I'm using the disposable beaker that came with the kit just to hold these things. You could use a glass or whatever you want. 
Okay, so I'm going to try to add this um, apple first, which is here. Okay, so I'm going to add my apple to the test tube. If you want to take your uh, blue forceps and wash them really well to do it before you use them, you can, but I'm just going to use my fingers here since I have clean gloves on. I'm just going to stuff it all in here because these quantities don't have to be absolutely exact, although you want them to be the same among all the foods. But that's sneezes recorded for history. Um, now you can take your glass stirring rod, which, uh, where is my glass stirring rod? Or you can just take a unlabeled clean pipette that you haven't used. I'm just going to use that. So this, this doesn't have any label on it. And just use it just, just to poke all the stuff down towards the bottom. Now just make sure you're not using the same pipette for the other foods. Okay, so I got my pulverized apple in there. I'm going to set that into the, my little beaker for a sec. I'm going to pull out the one that says potato. Now you want to make sure you're not using the same glove without cleaning it. So I'm going to wipe my glove off here on some paper towels. Um, okay, now i got to add the potato. Okay. So now i got my potato in here. Now I'm going to do the same thing with the liver. Again, just make sure everything's clean between adding these things. And I'm going to go ahead and stick this one in the test tube. And now I'm going to add the liver. So I'm going to pause this for a second. Okay, so I have all of my ingredients here. So I got my potato, my apple, and my liver. And just make sure you've pushed everything down to the bottom. You can also kind of tap them on the table and that will help scoot, it, scoot everything down. All right, so now we have our foods. We've unleashed the catalase enzyme from them by putting them in the food processor. Now we're going to add the hydrogen peroxide and that is where the reaction will start to occur. So the more catalase that's in the food, the more reaction will be taking place with the hydrogen peroxide. So think about it. What kind of reaction is going to take place? That hydrogen peroxide is, is being broken by the catalase enzyme into water and oxygen gas. And so how will you know if the reaction is taking place? You will see oxygen gas in the form of bubbles. All right, so let's see what happens. Now you try this with yours as you do this. Again, you can stop, rewind, etc. Okay, so let's add our hydrogen peroxide. Now we're going to be adding three milliliters of hydrogen peroxide to each of those tubes containing the food. So you have your pipette that you've labeled H2O2, right? Now if you look very closely at this pipette, it's what we call a graduated transfer pipette, that it has these designations all up the side, and each of those lines that has a number is one milliliter, and then there's a half milliliter between it. So it goes one, one and a half, two, two and a half, three. See if you can, if you can notice that. It might be hard to get in the camera, but find that on yours. So the top line here is three milliliters, and so you're going to add three milliliters of hydrogen peroxide to each of your tube. So to do this, you're going to squeeze it, keep it squeezed, stick it in the hydrogen peroxide, and slowly bring it up until it gets to three, and then keep your fingers exactly there, and then we'll transfer it into the tube. Now, you might want to pour some out, but I'm only using this hydrogen peroxide just for this experiment. I'm not going to be using it again in my bathroom. So I'm going to just go ahead and dip directly into this bottle because I'm going to throw it away afterwards. But if you think you're going to use your hydrogen peroxide again, you should pour this into another container like a, a glass or something. Okay. So I'm going to make sure you wear your, your goggles for this because hydrogen peroxide can hurt you. Okay, so I'm going to get out three milliliters. Okay, so three all the way up till it, again, you're bringing it up until it gets to three. So you got to go slowly to get it to three. And bring it slowly. Now mine is only going to two and a half, so I'm going to have to add another half after that. So first thing is I'm going to add it to my apple first. I'm just going to stick it in. You don't want to leave it right at the top. You want to pour it, kind of stick it in there, but don't touch the sides. Okay, and give it a little swirl. Okay, now set it down. And you want to work quickly so that you can compare these guys. Oh, and i got to add another half, half of a one for that. Okay, now I'm going to add three to the, the potato. Okay, and another half. Okay, swirl. 
Oh, and look at that. You can already see the bubbles. And finally, another three to the liver. Whoa, already, whoa, did you guys see that? Oh, it's spilling over, woo! Okay, so that happened fast and I haven't even swirled it yet or added the final half, half a thing. Okay, whoa. Okay, so now you wanna watch these guys. So keep your goggles on, use a stopwatch, maybe on your phone or something, and you wanna watch these for five minutes, recording your observations of what's going on after each minute. So I don't know if you guys can see mine, but I mean, I'm gonna take mine out just, you leave yours in the thing, but just so you can see. So there is my liver. I mean, look at those bubbles up there. Again, that's oxygen gas in those bubbles. So cool. So that's my liver. And here's my apple. Not a whole lot going on in there. And here is my potato. Actually a lot going on in the potato. Maybe not as much as the liver, but you be the judge. But look what's happening with the, the potato here. It's like really small bubbles, but very foamy. So foam does not mean that there's as much oxygen in there as if it's, um, if it's big bubbles. Big bubbles mean lots of oxygen. Okay, so you're gonna watch that for five minutes and record your results. And I'm gonna come back in five minutes so that I can go on to the second part of this first part of the lab. Okay, so five minutes have gone by and you can see that my bubbles are just outrageous. I mean, look at this potato right here, good grief. What a mess. But what's going on in those tubes, right? You have hydrogen peroxide, you have the catalase from the foods, and then there's a reaction. So what's going to happen after five minutes? Well, you're going to need the three additional clean tubes here. So these are your enzyme tubes. And this time, we're going to label them L2, P2, and A2. So get back out your marker. I'm going to label one L2. Okay. I'm going to label one P2, and I'm going to label one A2. Now here's what we're going to do, and this gets a little messy. You're going to take the whole contents of what's in your first tubes, and you're going to pour them into the corresponding empty tubes. So L is going to get poured into L2, um, A into A2, and P into P2. Now why are we doing this, you may ask. Well, actually, before you do that, we're going to need some more food. So we're going to add another 5 grams of apple to the apple 2, another 5 grams of liver to the L2, and another 5 grams of potato to the P2. So you're going to need to get some more potato, apple, liver, weigh out 5 grams of each, just like we did before, process it in the food processor, just like we did before, and then come back. Okay, so I'm going to go do that. I'll be right back. Okay, so I have 5 grams of apple in the apple one. 5 grams of potato in the potato one, and 5 grams of liver in the liver one. So again, this is L2, P2, and A2. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my first three tubes that have already been reacted, and I'm just going to pour the liquid into their respective second tubes. So I'm going to start off with uh, apple. So I'm going to take my A tube and pour it into my A2 tube. Okay, so I'm just going to pour the liquid in there. Okay. Then uh, the first one you can set aside somewhere. I have a container here. I'm going to do it. I'm going to set that down. Now my L2, I'm going to pour, I mean my L that had the first initial liver, I'm going to pour into L2 that contains the new liver with new catalase. Not much liquid in there, huh? Why is that? Okay, so then I'm going to set the first tube aside. And set that down. And then finally my potato, I'm going to take this one and pour it into potato too. Wow, there's not much liquid in there either. Why is that? Ha ha ha. Okay, wow, not much at all, all to still react over there. Not much liquid. And transfer the liquid in if you needed to. So I'm going to do that in for one. Okay, so I'm going to get my glass stirring rod. It's clean, kind of mix up the first tube a little bit to unleash the liquid that's in there and pour that in if possible. Now this guy doesn't really have any liquid left and the reason why is because it's already been reacted. The hydrogen peroxide has already been reacted. Okay, so that's the best I can do. All right, so and then set aside the first tube. So now you have the first three tubes set aside, and now you just want to watch your new tubes for five minutes and see what's going on. You won't see much. And the question is, why aren't they reacting the way they did in the first tubes? What's happened? Well, 
the hydrogen peroxide's already been broken down, right, in the first tubes. And so remember what the products of breaking down hydrogen peroxide are. Oxygen gas and water. So what's in the liquid in the second set of tubes? Water. So that's water surrounding my liver right there. Um, so if the enzyme, the catalase, was highly reactive, there was a lot of it in that tissue initially in the first tubes, then it would have quickly dissolved all the hydrogen peroxide into water and oxygen gas, which is why you wouldn't see any reactivity in the second set of tubes. But um, if you see some reactivity in the second set of tubes, that means that the hydrogen peroxide was incompletely reactive in the first tubes. So if I look at my apple, which had the lowest reactivity in the first tubes, I don't know if you guys can see that, it's still reacting slightly, meaning that it's still some catalase left that's starting to leach out that is now starting to, to break down that hydrogen peroxide into water and oxygen gas. So what are your conclusions from this first part of the lab? What's the effect of concentration of catalase on its activity? Well, who had the most catalase? We'll see what your results are and we'll discuss them on the discussion board. All right, I'm gonna pause this. I'm gonna clean up my station. You guys do the same thing. Then we're going to come back and do the second part of the lab, which is the effects of pH on catalase activity. I'll be back. Okay, I've cleaned everything up. I hope you have too. And by the way, you might want to take like some um, soapy sponge or something and really clean your area because it's had liver, which you don't want to have that stuck to your table or whatever. Anyway, in the second part of the lab, we're looking at the effect of pH on the ability of catalase to catalyze the breakdown of hydrogen peroxide into water and oxygen. So hopefully you guys have all been able to find your purple cabbage at the grocery store. It's also called red cabbage. Um, and we're only gonna need about a quarter of this. We don't need that much. So get a clean knife and just go ahead and chop this baby, make about a quarter of it. So I'm gonna cut it here and cut it again the other way. Okay, so I have about a quarter of the cabbage and food processor blender is going to come very much in handy here because we're going to need to have cabbage juice. So I'm going to drop my cabbage in there. I'm going to do it like this. And this one you want to blend really, really nice because we need juice. So I'm going to pause this for a sec. So it turns out cabbage is very rich in catalase. I guess cabbage has a lot of hydrogen peroxide. It needs to, to break down. So it has a lot of catalase but it's also a pH indicator. It'll change colors in the presence of an acid and a base. How cool is that? So it's perfect for doing this part of the lab. So I'm gonna keep blending this for a while, get it really juicy. This one you want really juicy. You want lots of juice in there. You can squeeze out. You might wanna give it a little shake. Do it again. All right, I think this baby's as juicy as it's gonna get. So now we want to strain out the big parts and just, just use the little parts. So actually, I'm going to pause this. I'm going to get a big bowl just to catch this, which we'll then pour in our beaker. So I'll be right back. Okay, I got a fairly large mixing bowl just to collect this stuff. So now you're going to need a cheesecloth or something like it. So I'm using an old white t-shirt that I'm going to, I cut up and I'm going to use to strain out this juice. So let me grab it. Mm, chopped up cabbage smells great. Cabbage soup tonight. All right, so I have, uh, I have just an old t-shirt here. I'm going to lay it over. Let me bring this down so you can see what I'm doing. I'm going to go ahead and just lay it over the bowl. And I'm going to gently pour the contents of my cabbage, my chopped up cabbage, into, into the cheesecloth. Now, if you wanted, you could have used scissors to break the pieces up first. But my food processor kind of skips that step for me. Okay, so I got the, the chopped up cabbage in the cheesecloth, and now I'm going to bring this up, or this t-shirt, sorry, and I'm just going to squeeze out that juice. Mmm, purple. It's purple stuff. That's an old 80s commercial you guys probably don't remember. Anyway, I'm just going to keep squeezing it until I get all this wonderful juice out. Now, this isn't producing as much juice as I had wanted, but you can squeeze it and... You know, so I've had to redo some more cabbage to get enough juice, but I have about 30 milliliters of purple cabbage juice here now. Isn't that beautiful? Gorgeous. And it's a pH indicator. So now you're going to want to make sure you label new pipettes um, with different things. So you're going to want to label 
This pipette base, okay? Another pipette is gonna say cabbage, and that's for just dealing with the cabbage. So I'm gonna put that in the cabbage container here in the beaker. Um, one labeled H2O2, which if it's the same one from before, that's fine as long as it hasn't touched any of the foods that you were using. And, uh, and then you need one labeled acid. Okay, so I got one here labeled acid. And one labeled neutral. Okay, so that's labeled neutral. All right, so we have all our things labeled. We need to label test tubes. Now notice I've taken three of the test tubes from the first part of the lab, thoroughly cleaned them out. You wanna make sure they're really clean, but now we're gonna label them. You can scratch out the old labels and we wanna label one B for base, one N for neutral and one A for acid. And now we need to put um, five milliliters of cabbage juice into each one of these test tubes using the cabbage pipette. Um, and so you're going to have to go twice here. So when you scoop it up, it looks like it goes to two and a half. So we'll need to do that twice. And go ahead and put it right down into kind of the bottom here. So let's see if I can do this up close to the camera. Can you guys see that? Okay, so that's two and a half. So I got to go again. Another two and a half. So that's five milliliters of cabbage juice in there. Okay, five mils into the B. Um, now you're going to need something to hold these test tubes up while you work. So uh, regular old drinking glasses work fine. And I'm going to, I actually got out three tall drinking glasses. So I'm going to go ahead and set my base test tube into the first drinking glass just, just to hold it. Okay, let's go ahead and add five milliliters of cabbage juice to the next test tube, which in this case is the neutral one. And, okay. Five milliliters of purple juice there. I'm going to put that into another drinking glass just to hold it up. Just remember, make sure you can see the labels so you know which is which. And the third test tube gets five mils of cabbage juice. So pretty. All right. So, if you guys can see this, I have my three sets of purple cabbage juice here, one into each of the three labeled test tubes. And now we're going to start adding our bases. Now, the first thing we need to do is dilute our ammonia base. So again, we're using Lysol or another ammonia base cleaner, Mr. Clean, I think. There, there's several on the market. Just make sure you test, look at the ingredients, make sure it has at least ammonium chloride in it, some kind of ammonia. We got to dilute this baby. So we're going to do what's called a one to 10 dilution. We're going to add one milliliter of ammonium chloride, Lysol, into a graduated cylinder and then add another nine milliliters of water to it. Give it a little swirl and that will um, make a diluted form of ammonia at a one to 10 solution. Okay, so I'm going to very carefully, and again, I'm not gonna use this for anything except this lab. So I, I can actually dip right into the bottle. If you think you're gonna use this again, then it's always a good idea to pour it into another container first. Now don't whiff this in and again, make sure there's no bleach in the area. Um, you're going to use your pipette that's labeled base, because this is a base, it's a strong base, it's probably about a 9 or 10, I, I don't have pH paper with me to test it, but that's probably what it is. And you're going to want your little 10 milliliter graduated cylinder. So find your little 10 milliliter graduated cylinder. Now don't breathe the stuff in, and I'm just going to add one milliliter to my graduated cylinder. Now here's the deal, and I'm going to put this away, okay, so make sure you don't mix it with anything else. I'm going to put the top back on the Lysol so we're not sitting here breathing in Lysol. Okay, I'm going to set that aside. Now, here's the deal. When, um, I'm going to put my finger over this just so gases don't get out. When you're reading your graduated cylinder, there always is a little dip at the bottom. That's called the meniscus, the very bottom of that dip. I think we mentioned this in the first lab. You want to read right at the bottom of that dip. So hold your graduated cylinder up, kind of level, and make sure it has that little dip. So now that the bubbles are going away, mine's actually a little less than one milliliter. So I'm going to pause this and adjust it to one milliliter. I'll be right back. Okay, so I have that at one milliliter. I have a glass of water here. Um, you can use a clean pipette, but since this won't have anything except water in it, I'm going to use the base one again. I'm not going to be drinking this water, and I'm going to wash the glass thoroughly. And I'm going to now add enough water to my one milliliter of 
um, ammonia to bring it up to 10. So I'm going to be adding in 9 milliliters of water to this. So basically until you get to the 10 milliliter mark at the bottom of the meniscus. Okay, so there we go. You can tap it down a little bit and make sure the things are out. All right, um, so that's to the 10 milliliter mark. You can actually, you can use your... Um, you can use your glass stirring rod for this if you want. Just make sure it's clean. So I have mine over here. Make sure this is clean. So it's your glass stirring rod. And swirl it up real good. And then you want to go wash it. Okay, so um, wash it afterwards. So I'm going to pause this and go wash it. Okay, I got that washed. So now I'm going to, now again, you want to be wearing your goggles, your gloves, everything the whole time with this because this is uh, some nasty stuff here. All right, so now I'm going to add just part of this to my cabbage. So I'm going to add, I'm, again, I'm taking the base test tube. So always make sure you have the right, I mean, transfer pipe, but make sure you have the right ones. This is the one that says base. And now I have my diluted base, and I'm going to add three milliliters of the diluted base to my base test tube that contains the cabbage juice. So, again, this only goes up to two and a half when you first squeeze it. And uh, so just note where it is and then fill it up throughout. So actually, I, I owe about another one and a half or one and a quarter right there. So I'm going to grab my the one I labeled base. That's my acid. Here is my neutral. Okay, so this is my base. And I'm going to go ahead and add it very gently there and give it a little swirl. Okay, so I just added a base. We'll see what happens with that. Okay. And then I'm going to switch pipetters. This is now you can take your diluted base and, and throw it away if you want. Throw it down the sink and rinse it really well. Um, I'm going to take my acid, which is going to be vinegar. And, you know, again, you I'm not going to reuse this. So, you know, you can take it right there. Okay. And I'm going to add three mils of acid here. So I'm going to go to my acid test tube. So that's only two and a half. Another one here. There. Ooh, you see, already see that? Can you see the, the color change occurring, especially when you swirl it? And you can actually, if you, your glass rod is, stirring rod is clean, go ahead and mix it up with the glass stirring rod. Okay. Wow. And you already see a color change. Put it back in the glass. Okay. I'm going to pause this, go clean the glass stirring rod. Okay. So we already have a, a change in color with that one. I'm going to uh, stir up the base one a little bit better because that one's not quite doing what I expected. Maybe a slight color change, but not a whole lot. In really strong bases, um, the cabbage juice probably should uh, turn green. This might be a little too dilute. So you can play around with it, add maybe you know try redoing it with um, more than one milliliter of ammonia. You can try two. And, and then eight with eight mils of water and just play around with those, see if you can get a green color change. So this Lysol is probably more dilute than I had expected, and so it's not changing as much, but the, um, the acid is. And the main reason for us seeing the color change is just to make sure that's an acid and that's a base. That's, that's what the indicator juice, cabbage juice, tells us is that we're dealing with acid, base, or neutral. Um, for control, we're going to take the one labeled neutral and add in three mils of just water. Okay, so this is two and a half and three okay and swirl it around if your glass rod's clean you can stir it but you wouldn't expect a color change because this is just diluting your cabbage juice so it should be a neutral pH which it is because it didn't change color and in fact if you look at the difference in color between the um, neutral and the base you can see there is a color difference so this is a kind of more greenish purple so this is a base this is neutral and this is our acid. Okay, so we've made our acid, base, and, and base and neutral solutions. So we're ready to go and look at the effect of pH on catalase activity. So back to our hydrogen peroxide from before. Okay, here's our hydrogen peroxide. And you want to get your hydrogen peroxide um, pipette. So find where that is. Okay, so here's your H2O2 pipette. And now we're going to add two milliliters of hydrogen peroxide to each one of these tubes and give it a good swirl. So try to have your glass stirring rod done. OK, 
Okay, there's two mils of that. Swirl, swirl, swirl. And two mils of that. Swirl, swirl, swirl. Ah, oh, look at the bubbles. Catalase, woo, getting all over the place. And two mils into my base. And let's see if we get any reaction there. Little bit, right? So you get a little bit of reactivity, actually it's quite a lot in this case, in the base, but not as much as in the neutral. And nothing, hardly, in the acid. So why isn't it reacting in the acid? Because what happened to the catalase from the cabbage? Denatured, right? Whereas when we didn't affect the pH, this baby's going crazy. So it's taking all that catalase from the cabbage and making it go crazy. And the base is also going kind of crazy, maybe not as much, but clearly the base is not affecting the catalase the way that the acid is affecting the catalase. And that's what we predict, that, you know, ideally the catalase loves neutral, right? That's the pH of most of our body. So that's what it likes. Doesn't like acid, it's kind of okay with base, but if this was a really strong base, we might not be able to get the reaction that we're having, but Lysol was pretty dilute. So it's reacting, but it's not reacting as fast as the neutral, in my experiment anyway. So anyway, hope you had fun doing the lab. It's a big, messy lab, probably one of the messiest of, of the semester. And uh, let me know on the discussion board what, what kinds of uh, results you got, how much fun you had, what'd you think? Did you learn about enzymes and the effects of pH and concentration on their activity? All right, see you next week.